world history, am I right? There is just a lot. This video is an attempt to look at Russia from the beginning of the course all the way to the end to help you with all that knowledge swirling around in your brain from each of the units to be placed in one single video as we connect the dots. I keep saying it, but I don't want you to feel like this. Or this. Or even like the course is making you feel like you're constantly getting pushed around. Off the bat, Russia is already a little tricky as they are technically in two regions, Europe and Asia. However, if you notice, there's just kind of this white blank space on the College Board region map, which I'm sure Putin is all upset about. He can't even get a mention on a simple AP world map where he is the largest country in the world. I mean, Russia has 11% of the world's land mass in their one country. One of my students' dads is a professor, and he wrote this article that argues that a lot of Putin's actions are coming from this place where he feels a lack of respect on a global scale and constantly has kind of been left out of the cool kids' table. And I kind of tend to agree with his argument. Now, in saying that, let's preface this whole video is really actually shaped by a few realities. I am American. I've lived during the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. And in fact, I've even traveled to Moscow, which was a really cool experience. All these things shape the things that I'm saying. Also, the reality of Putin's invasion of Ukraine is something that we've all watched on TV and lived and seen the atrocities with our own eyes. The chances, let's be honest, that I'm getting back into Russia after this video probably pretty slim. So living a little dangerously in this video. And where we're starting today, we're gonna pick up the course in the year 1200, the era of state building and expanding trade networks. We will see that early state building in the region first starts around the Kiev and Rus, which is modern day Ukraine, not even Russia. They will first rise as early traders in fish and furs and grain ever since the 400s. And they were connected with the Byzantine Empire or what was formerly known as the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, one of the themes of the first unit is the effect that religion has on culture and societies. And in this region, we will see how Orthodox Christianity will spread from the Byzantine Empire into the region. As you can see from even our trip, you can see clearly the influence of Orthodox churches in Moscow today. Moscow is said to be founded in the year 1147. However, people had been living there for a few hundred years. Both Kiev and Moscow were conquered by the Mongols. Moscow in 1238, and Kiev in 1240. They and the other Rus principalities were absorbed into the golden horde of the Mongol Empire. Now, Mongol rule in Russia was different from its other Khanates, but mostly due to their geography. The land was simply not very friendly to nomadic ways of the Mongols, and they had really harsh winters. So instead, we find the Mongols indirectly ruled the Golden Horde by extracting tribute and taxes from the Russian princes. In fact, they gave Ivan I the title of Grand Prince. Now, this tributary relationship will continue as we shift into the next historical period of our course, the years of 1450 to 1750, the era of large land-based empires and the rise of European maritime empires. While Russia is technically in two regions, Moscow is in Europe, and they continue to be engaged in trade with other European nations despite Mongol rule. In 1480, Ivan III, or Ivan the Great, threw off the chains of the Mongol rule and refused to pay tribute anymore. Like other European states, he established absolute rule in Russia. Orthodox Christianity, which is often known as Russian Orthodoxy, will be the prevalent cultural unifier, again, which spread from the Byzantine Empire. And just like there, there's not really a separation of church and state. Absolute rule will continue then with Ivan's grandson, Ivan IV. He uses the term Caesar to claim the lineage back to that Roman Empire. Remember, Caesar in Russian is Tsar. He legitimizes his rule by building big stuff, monumental architecture, and linking his rule to religion all in one act. Well, how did he do that? Well, he built St. Basil's Cathedral. And I mean, check this out. We were there in 2015, looking a little bit younger. Ivan IV expands Russia's holdings to the east, to, into Siberia, um, by using the Cossacks, or free men, who received special privileges from the Russian government in return for their military service. Check out Ben Freeman's illustrative examples video about this for more in-depth knowledge about the Cossacks. Now, Ivan also wasn't a huge fan of the boyars, who were the nobles who owned the land within Russian society. He had a mistrust that they had political interests, and those political interests were probably linked to his parents' death. 
possibly true. He made some reforms to check the power of these wealthy families, the boyars, and shifted towards more requirements of service to the czar. Again, this is the era of strong land-based empires, and Ivan IV? was building just that. He also maintained his rule through harsh absolute rule, which is probably where he gained the title Ivan the Terrible. He executed his opponents quite brutally and even killed his own dynastic line of succession in a fit of rage. Now, this is followed up by the time of troubles, which is a lot of unrest and fighting um, for the throne in Russia. But by 1613, a new dynasty will emerge and that will last the way to 1917, the Romanov dynasty. It was founded by Mikhail Romanov, where he too increased the land holdings of Russia towards the Pacific to the east, which then loops us back to the theme of large land-based empires during this time period. Now, the most famous Romanov is not Natasha. The most famous Romanov would be Peter the Great, who came to power in 1682, and he believed that Russia needed to be like Europe. He forcefully modernized and westernized Russia. He wanted a strong naval fleet like those rising European maritime empires had. But the problem was is they didn't have a seaport in Russia. But it's the time of absolute rulers, so he took it from Sweden, and he built the city of St. Petersburg. Well, he didn't. The serfs did. Serfs were forced to build the city of St. Petersburg. And strangely enough, today it's known as the City of Bones because of how many people died while building it. Even in Moscow, they commemorate his influence by this giant, black, huge, ship-shaped monument along the river. Some say it's an eyesore, but again... They are honoring Peter the Great and his influence on Russia. Now, Peter's fascination with Europe made him want Russians to look like Europeans. So he forced men to uh, shave those beards and wear shorter jackets. As Russia also modernized their military, adopted gunpowder weapons, which increased their strength in this era of land-based empires. However, their lack of close proximity to the Atlantic even, or the Indian Ocean for sure, left Russia out of the successful powers during this time period. It's important to connect the dots, that Russia's main competition will be those French and British fur traders who are setting up their maritime empires in North America. Now this leads us to the next time period of 1750 to 1900. This is the era that's focused on the Industrial Revolution and imperialism, which will both have their impact on Russia. Catherine the Great is yet another Romanov leader who will rule Russia in the mid-1750s when this time period begins. She married into the family by marrying her second cousin. He had a lot of character flaws, to put it nicely, and strangely enough, he was a really big fanboy of Russia's political rival, Prussia. Now, the marriage was a disaster because she married her cousin. I'm just telling you, that's like a red flag from the get-go. And she most likely to occupy her time read a lot, including Enlightenment philosophers. She even was friends with Voltaire, and she was said to be a woman with little beauty, but she had charm and charisma. Despite all of that, she wasn't very active with her neurotic husband's second cousin. She had other lovers who fathered her three children. Once her husband became the leader of Russia, he left the Seven Years' War, which was against Prussia, which he was a fanboy of, and then became allies with Prussia. He was going to get rid of his wife, Catherine, but people were more of a fan of her than of him. With the support of the military, the government, and the enlightened aristocracy, they force her husband to give up the throne, and she becomes the leader of Russia. Hey her husband gets assassinated eight days later. What a strange coincidence. And let's pause right there because there are a few girl bosses in history. So let's take a moment to appreciate someone who is not male, who made it into our course, which is a massive change from the continuity of patriarchy throughout it all. It was during her reign that Russia looked to continue and become more Western. And while she once had intended to free the serfs, she doubled down and actually strengthened the hold that serfdom had within Russia. During her rule, the famous Pukachev Rebellion occurred, where a Cossack, who acted as though he was Catherine's dead husband, who was really dead, incited the greatest rebellion in Russian history. He was unsuccessful, and they were defeated. Now remember, during this era, the Industrial Revolution is catching steam. I know. I can't help myself. In Great Britain and in neighboring European countries like France and Belgium and Germany, as well as the United States, and it's starting to spread to Russia. Now, Russia is still operating with an absolute monarchy, and the Tsar's power was unchecked. 
Once again, it will be the Romanov government that's going to be pushing for industrial growth in the 1860s with Sergei Witte. They had state-driven industries versus those independently driven ones in other European countries or the United States. They focused on building the Trans-Siberian Railroad and connected their vast empire. This also connects them to the Asian markets. They focused mostly on heavy industries like iron, shipbuilding, and steel. While most European nations freed their serfs a while ago and left the feudal period, it wasn't until 1861 that Russia did which allowed them to have this new labor source for their factories. Now, this will also lead to the emergence of a middle class in Russia. Once this began, we realized that during this time period, most industrialized countries also started being imperialistic, which is also true of Russia, as they expanded to the east and set their eyes on new lands. Which will lead us to the final time period in our course, 1900 to present. This is a time of the World Wars, the Cold War, and obviously both of those are going to play major roles in Russian history. Now, the first major event that impacts Russian prestige is the loss in the Russo-Japanese War as they were expanding east into Asia and running into a modernizing Japanese state who was doing the same. This war lasted from 1904 to 1905 over their rival imperial ambitions in Manchuria and Korea. Now, Russia loses, and Japan only gets stronger during this time period. The Romanov dynasty was led by Tsar Nicholas II at this time, and things were not looking good. As people push for reforms within Russia for more representative rule and rights, Nicholas made some empty promises for constitution and representative assemblies like the Duma, but really just favored absolute rule. Add in the events of World War I and the monarchy was declining fast. Now the Great War, later known as World War I, will break out in 1914 after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is the spark that lights all those other main causes of World War I to be activated. Military buildup was happening around Europe, including Russia, due to the Industrial Revolution. The alliance system caused Russia to back their allies of France, and their nationalistic fervor helped them support the Slavic people, like the Serbians who were given the ultimatum after the assassination. Yes, Russia did seem to mobilize their military before any official declaration of war ever even occurred, but as we know, 1914 is when World War I began. Russia sustained major casualties during the fighting, and it was wildly unpopular in Russia. Riots broke out in 1917 against Tsar Nicholas II, and he eventually stepped down. The Romanov family was sent off to West Siberia and then moved one more time before there was an attempted rescue to get the Tsar back. To thwart the plan, they killed the entire family. Now, a provisional government was in power for a time, and then it was followed by the bloody Bolshevik Revolution led by Vladimir Lenin. The Bolsheviks believed in a working class revolution pointing back to the ideals of Karl Marx as they established a communist government. Lenin promoted the idea of peace, land, and bread, as so many civilians were facing starvation during World War I. Once Lenin was in control, they dipped and they were out of World War I. But by 1921, the Russian economy was not doing well. And Lenin introduced a program called the New Economic Policy, which allowed farmers to sell excess of whatever they had, which was really a small-scale, limited capitalistic system. In 1922, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, was formed. And this was a case of some joining voluntarily and others being forcibly occupied by the Soviet Red Army as they became part of a more modern Soviet empire. While initially there were four republics, there will eventually be 15 Soviet republics, including countries like Belarus and Kazakhstan and Lithuania and Ukraine, to name a few. It prided itself on being a multi-ethnic empire, which was united under the ideals of communism. Now, upon the death of Vladimir Lenin, we will see the rise of Joseph Stalin. This Soviet political system was very authoritarian and highly centralized. And this was also true of their economic system, where the USSR are owned the means of production, distribution, and exchange. Stalin's most famous economic focus was his five-year plans, which really hoped to have the USSR catch up to the industrial powers around the world, and he pushed for the collectivization of farms, which led to some significant famines and millions of people starving to death. One example of this would be in Ukraine, where famine there cost nearly four million people their lives 
or about 13% of their population. This was known as the Holodomor. This famine was largely caused by Stalin who forcibly eliminated Ukraine's small farms with these state-run collectives. If any farmer were to save grain for themselves versus giving it to the collective, their punishment was death. Stalin painted farmers as resistors who couldn't meet their quotas and even targeted intellectuals with his 1932 decree, which targeted Ukrainian saboteurs and ordered local officials to stop using Ukrainian as a language as most of their correspondent needed to be in Russian and fall in line with the USSR. Similar policies were created in the Baltic republics of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, where the Red Army moved in and occupied their land in 1940. Intellectuals and resistors were sent off to brutal labor camps, even to Siberia, where more people died, like millions. Then came the rise of Hitler in Europe, and what we know today will become World War II. Initially, Stalin signs the non-aggression pact with Hitler, where they agree not to engage in military action against each other, which leaves the Soviets out of World War II, initially. In June of 1941, Nazi Germany launches a surprise attack against the Soviets that they signed the pact with. Obviously, the Soviets defended themselves and joined World War II on then the side of the Allies and fight to push Nazi Germany back. Eventually, the Allies will be victorious as they race to Berlin from either side of Europe. The winners of World War II are often referred to as the Big Three. We had Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and the United States' as President FDR, and later Harry Truman when FDR passes away in 1945. The Big Three gathered in Potsdam, Germany, to negotiate the terms for the end of World War II. Stalin is kind of like this ultimate third wheel. There's so much backstory to their drama. They had competing ideologies with the difference between capitalism and socialism and democracy versus communism. There were deep differences on what ideology was better. Plus, there was resentment on both sides. The United States tried to stop the Russian Revolution, which led to their communist nation, and the Soviets were willing to sign a non-aggression pact with Hitler. Not cool. In fact, when we traveled to Moscow, it was the 70th anniversary of Victory Day in Europe which really was unplanned by our part. It just so happened to be there because we found cheap tickets. And there was a lot of state-supported nationalism happening with tanks and military parades. But there was also a lot of patriotism by the average person and how their families were impacted by the devastating losses that Russians experienced during World War II. Basically, all families were connected in some way. It was a really cool experience but also strange. Well, they had lots of pictures of Stalin since he was the ruler, and that guy killed a lot of people. Dare I say, equally as bad as Hitler. So, that was strange. And well, this obviously leads us into the Cold War, which was between the United States and the Soviet Union, which is a huge focus of Unit 8 in AP World History. The Soviets formed the Warsaw Pact, which was a military alliance to respond to the newly created NATO alliance in Western Europe. This pact was a collective defense treaty established by the Soviet Union and seven other Soviet satellite states in Central and Eastern Europe. Satellite states were essentially allies of the Soviet Union, but not technically a part of the USSR. They included states like East Germany and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and Poland. Despite the Cold War not having direct warfare between the Soviets and the United States, they were engaged in proxy wars. The Soviets sponsored North Korea and some minimal involvement in the war in Vietnam, which had a larger support from the communist nation of China. Additionally, the Soviets under Nikita Khrushchev sent nuclear missiles to Fidel Castro in Cuba, and they were involved in other areas of Latin America, such as with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and Chile under Salvador Allende. Under Soviet leader Lenin Brezhnev, they also invaded Afghanistan to support the communist government there, which was not highly successful and very costly, and additionally caused economic issues for the Soviet Union. Now, Cold War competition continued through the 50s, and the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s, and we have the armed arms race as both countries are building more nukes. We have the space race as people are trying to get to the moon. Proxy wars, covert operations to support or overthrow various leaders in foreign countries, and a whole lot of propaganda. The Cold War will eventually end. 
major factors include the Soviet Union's costly and ultimately failed invasion of Afghanistan, which many would say is the Soviet's version of America's Vietnam War, and public discontent in the communist countries, specifically in Eastern Europe. Hungarians wanted the Soviets to leave their country as Imre Naj declared kind of more freedoms from the Soviets' influence and withdrew from the Warsaw Pact only to have the Soviets invade Budapest and execute Naj. Khrushchev had formally pledged a retreat from the Stalinist policies and repression of the past, but the violent actions in Budapest suggest otherwise. Most people remember the Prague Spring, in which demonstrators wanted more free speech and more democratic reforms in Czechoslovakia. Alexander Dubček wanted to undo some of those Stalinist repressive ideas and had something, an idea called socialism with a human face. But yet again, the Soviets invade Czechoslovakia and crush the movement. Eventually we arrive at the final leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. He will come to control in 1985 and is seen as more progressive. He had two major reforms, perestroika, which was the restructuring of the Soviet economy to allow some aspects of a market economy, along with glasnost, which was involving more transparency and fought against corruption in the Soviet government. His progressive reforms brought a lot of communist criticism and opposition to him. Now, Gorbachev and US President Reagan met multiple times, and eventually agreed on a nuclear arms treaty after a lot of rhetoric going back and forth. As democratic movements continued to spread across Eastern Europe, countries declared kind of their independence from the Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989, and Germany reunified as one country. In 1991, there was a Russian coup to remove Gorbachev from power to save the Soviet Union. But at the end of the day, the goal to save the Union actually caused its demise. And with that, the Cold War had ended. The former 15 republics of the USSR formed 15 independent countries as of December 31st, 1991. And as someone who really enjoyed geography tests as a child, there were now 15 new countries where I just used to write USSR. This also explains how growing up, I thought the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster of 1986 occurred in Russia. Because the idea of Russia and the various republics of the Soviet Union were just so like intertwined in my mind, like synonyms, one in the same. But the Chernobyl disaster was in Ukraine, not Russia. However, it was a product of faulty Soviet reactor design, coupled with some serious mistakes made by the plant operators, which at the end of the day were a direct consequence of Cold War isolation, their competition, and just a clear lack of safety culture around nuclear energy. 9.1 is all about the advances in technology, and one of those advances is within the energy field, or energy technologies, as the use of nuclear power increased significantly after the first power plant was created in 1951. Nuclear power has a huge capacity to create a lot of energy and a lot of electricity. While many argue that the incidences like Chernobyl in 1986 and the Fukushima disaster of 2011 in Japan show the fragility of nuclear power and the potential nuclear nuclear fallout from faulty nuclear facilities. Others argue that they overall have a great safety record and produce so much more clean power. Something else you should understand is the idea of economic liberalization, which is what happened when the former Eastern Bloc countries that were once under the Soviet sphere of influence were now able to trade freely with the countries around the world. The idea of free markets or free market capitalism is where economies are driven by supply and demand. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russian's economy was in shambles. They shifted from a command economy where the production of goods and prices were all controlled by the government to a market-based system, which was really unprecedented in all of history. Many of their industries were heavy industrial products or military focused. In 1995, Russia secured loans from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, which is a global world organization, typically that works alongside of the World Bank, to help developing nations, more or less. Uh, however, the twin organizations have many critics as they have high interest rates, which really hurt developing countries in the long run. Some would argue they're more like payday loan stores or a loan shark. They step in to rescue in your time of need, but hurt more in the long term than help. The next step for Russia as they switched to a market economy was the privatization of Russian industries. 
Friends, this for sure will help you understand today as we make sense of some of the world right now. You may have heard the word Russian oligarch lately. When Russia was selling off control of industries once controlled by the government, like manufacturing plants, oil, media companies, pants companies, a cookie factory, everything was in the hands of the Russian government. And now they needed to switch everything that was in the hands of the Russian government into private enterprises, private businesses. To make this overly simple, the government gave out vouchers to Russians to buy stock in new companies, or they could be sold. Well, as many people were hardcore struggling in Russia amidst hyperinflation, many of these soon-to-be Russian oligarchs went around on a buying spree buying up everyone's vouchers. These oligarchs bought into companies like they were picking up bankrupted companies or about to flip a rundown house and make it big. But they had a lot of houses they bought and they made it big. Over time, as the economy grew, these oligarchs grew crazy rich. Add in some extra levels of sketchy that we're not gonna get into where there's a loan for share scheme which helped the failing government under Yeltsin pay for their bills. These guys were epically rich, like billionaires. Oligarchs essentially made it so that Russia didn't fall back into communism. And these oligarchs who were not government leaders, not working in the government, but just really rich men, had a lot of influence in the Russian government. And that still continues still today. When President Yeltsin stepped down in 1999, he's the ruler right after Gorbachev. Do you know who the person they named as the leader was? Vladimir Putin. He served two terms as president and then in 2008 named Dmitry Medvedev as his successor. And then Medvedev named Putin as his prime minister. Very interesting. And then in 2012, Putin was elected for a third term as president and then Medvedev became prime minister. Minister, does this feel weird yet? Feel very non-democratic? Yeah. So many Russians and didn't agree either. And Putin wasn't really a huge fan of opposition leaders. And a lot of times they were jailed or poisoned like Alexei Navalny in 2020. Others, you know, went missing or ended up shot in front of the Kremlin or died in foreign countries were found dead elsewhere. Putin ran again in 2018 and won, and seemingly can run again in 2024. How legit these elections are, are questionable. So in 2022, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, Putin stated his purpose was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. His declared aim was to protect the people, subjected to what he called eight years of bullying and genocide by the Ukrainian government. Now, I would love for all of my student historians who are watching this to analyze what he is saying and what he is not saying. Ukrainian President Zelensky is Jewish. His grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. The idea that he is a Nazi is simply a bit wild. Others may be arguing that Putin's goal is actually to prove a point. As Ukraine is becoming closer and closer to joining NATO, a military alliance that is not a fan of Russia, or perhaps join the European Union. Now, how long will this war last and what will the result be? We don't know. And everyone is painfully aware that Putin is getting away with this because he has nuclear weapons and we don't wanna start World War III. What is gonna be the end result? It's a great question and I wish I could tell you the answer to it. So the foreign states have seized assets of oligarchs like a $90 million yacht or just allowing them not to have access to their money like locking their accounts or cutting them off of swift transactions. They're hoping that putting pressure on the oligarchs would change Putin's actions in Ukraine. However, in the last week, two Russian oligarchs were found dead alongside of their families within 48 hours of each other in alleged murder suicides. That would make it six oligarchs alone in 2022 that have committed suicide. I sure hope as you're watching this, this makes you ask some questions. I'm not trying to make you go all conspiracy theorists on you here, but hopefully your crap detector is going off or at least see some red flags about this situation. What's gonna happen next? 
Only time will tell. And on that happy note, let's do the one minute recap. <laughs> Rushes into regions, Europe and Asia. Roots are linked to the Byzantine Empire and they share Eastern Orthodox beliefs. They were conquered by the Mongols. They became part of the Golden Horde. They didn't occupy though because it was cold. Ivan the Great stopped paying taxes and tribute to the Mongols. They broke free. And then Ivan the Fourth, he's terrible. But he built Candyland, I mean St. Basil's Cathedral, to legitimize his rule. He arms the Cossacks. He expands the Russian Empire. He has a secret police and tortures people grotesquely and kills them who oppose him. Not that that doesn't happen still today. He kills his line of succession and then he had the time of troubles till they were a new dynasty, the Romanovs. It lasts a very long time. Peter the Great wants them to be more like Europeans and modernize. He builds St. Petersburg after taking land from Sweden. He wanted to be like those European maritime empires, but they were still behind. Catherine the Great comes along and marries her husband, I mean cousin, and he dies. She's all enlightened as pen pals with Voltaire, but she doesn't free the serfs. Later they do, and they start more state-driven industrialization to keep up with the Europeans. The serfs are now freed and can work for low wages. They built up heavy industries like steel and military weapons. Then World War One happens. They mobilize before whatever is declared. They fight with Germany, the Ottomans, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's big casualties. Russians are not excited about the war. In fact, Germans send Lenin back to Russia and hope that he starts a revolution. Oh wait, the Russian revolution happens and they do leave World War I. It turns communist and Lenin is the leader. Soviet Union is formed, Lenin dies, Stalin is the new leader. He has five-year plans to industrialize and collectivization of all the farms. Then World War II breaks out, but not for them because they signed the non-aggression pact. But then Hitler invades. They are in a war with the Allies, racing to Berlin. They win. Now we have two great superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. Cue the Cold War. Democracy versus communism, capitalism versus socialism. Not fighting with the United States, though, because it's a Cold War. But there's lots of proxy wars. Korean War, Vietnam, Afghanistan. There's a military alliance known as the Warsaw Pact. There's the nuclear arms race. They're racing to space. And eventually things change. There's uprisings in the Soviet spheres of influence. Hungary, Czechoslovakia. Baltic stakes. The Berlin Wall comes down. There's a coup to overthrow Gorbachev to save the Soviet Union, but it actually leads to the fall of the Soviet Union that they were trying to save. Yeltsin is now the president. It changes to a market economy. Oligarchs get stupid rich. Putin comes to power and then does again and again. And again. He then invades Ukraine and we, the world, are not happy with him. So there you have it. An overview of Russia from the beginning of the course to the end, which helps you for sure learn about yesterday so we can understand today and write a better tomorrow. Ukraine, we stand with you and we stand with freedom and we stand against those who want power at the expense of people's lives and their freedoms. Now, I sure hope that was helpful, not just to prepare you for the AP exam though, because life is bigger than that one test, but legit so that you can understand the world today. Subscribe to the channel and check out the rest of the series as I help you review region by region, but also challenge you to make the world a better place. Till next time.